Welcome everyone. We're so pleased to have you here for our sixth session of Gallagher Talks. This session topic is the other types of virus you should be worried about. So of course, we'll be talking about cyber insurance and why it's so important all the time, but especially in times like today, be conscious of cyber and cyber insurance. I'm pleased to introduce with to you our speakers this afternoon, Joe Hines, our commercial account executive and cyber specialist from the Atlantic region, along with Brian Dagg, an account executive in commercial insurance and specialist in cyber insurance coming from Winnipeg. If you'd like more information on Brian and Joe, feel free to click on the right side of the screen and connect with them on LinkedIn. A couple of other items before we get started. You will be receiving a recording of this webinar after the sessions are completed. And because of the fast paced nature of the talks today, any questions that are sent into the question and answer box will be answered following the sessions. Now for anyone who's having difficulties throughout the session, please use the question and answer box and our team here will do our best to troubleshoot you and help you through the session. We hope you enjoy this topic and remember that if you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, please share your experience today by using the hashtag Gallagher Talks. I also wanted to mention we have other sessions taking place throughout the day covering areas such as construction, fintech, captives and more. So just follow the link that will pop up at the bottom of the screen in this session. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to Brian and Joe to talk to us about cyber insurance. Thanks, Tyler, and hello, everyone, and welcome to our cyber focus presentation as part of the, the Gallagher Talk series. Um, we hope to find, we hope you find the discussions we have today of value, and we want to thank you all for joining us. First of all, I would like to introduce this session's speaker, Brian Dagg. Um, Brian is responsible for overseeing Gallagher's cyber risk practice for the Prairie region throughout the education, placement, and sale of cyber insurance policies to clients of all types. Personally, I am responsible for overseeing Gallagher cyber risk practice for the Atlantic region through the education placement and sale of cyber insurance policies to clients of all types. Both Brian and I actively consult with cybersecurity experts across Canada to assist clients with providing risk management expertise and augmenting cybersecurity strategies with cyber insurance risk transfer solutions. So we'll take a look at the agenda for today. Um, today we will review the following topics and we will start with discussing the current cyber risk landscape. We will then touch on the evolution of the cyber insurance marketplace and we will finish with the presentation by discussing prevention, mitigation and risk transfer solutions to protect your organization. Moving to the next slide, as you can see in the data shown in the graphics from Beasley's 2020 breach briefing, business email compromise or BEC is seen a slight decrease as attackers refocus on ransomware. While ransomware continues to increase exponentially year over year. I guess my first question to you, Brian, is, is what does the outlook for 2020 look like and are these trends continuing? Uh, thanks, Joe, and thanks to everybody for participating and taking the time to, uh, to sit with us today. Um, the charts that show on the screen uh, indicate trends that, that were existent through 2019. Um, the rise of ransomware has certainly continued across the globe. Uh, as we work through the 2020 calendar year uh, and Canada itself has seen a very large increase uh, in cyber events in general, but ransomware specifically. Um, ransomware demands, demands have grown in, in significance and in addition to these increased demands comes a shift also in the threat uh, actors from solely demanding a ransom in exchange for decryption tools to access your data or unlock your data to actually threatening to release data on either the public facing internet or the dark web if, if these demands are not met or the, dem the demands are not paid. So it's one thing if we if we can access our data uh, through other sources um, and perhaps we aren't going to suffer a, a network interruption as the result of the ransom demand, um, but now they're also threatening to release that information um, should we not pay the ransom itself again. Um, so not only is it is it issues with data accessibility and, and the data corruption, um, but also the potential for a widespread data breach uh, and the corresponding litigation that might follow. So Brian, what, what impact has COVID had on these trends? I guess, or, or better yet, how has the exposure shifted in light of COVID? Obviously with the remote workforce or potential changes to how an organization may operate and the sensitivity of the information it may maintain. 
Increased security risks have stemmed um, from an increase in, in phishing attacks. Um, a recent Google uh, security report identified a 350% increase in attacks from February 2020 to March 2020 from a phishing perspective. Um, so COVID and the shift to remote working uh, certainly brought opportunity for threat actors. Um, these threat actors tend to thrive at instilling fear into one uh, when their resilience is being tested. Um, so early on in, in what I guess we'll call the COVID era of 2020, uh, the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity documented that there were significant increases in reports of cyber criminals using coronavirus or COVID related phishing campaigns and, and malware scans to try and entice users to, to click various malicious links, uh, open various malicious attachments. Uh, and so we've seen this continue through Q2 and into Q3 uh, with a certain uptick in, in claims activity from a social engineering or a business email compromise uh, standpoint. Um, for those that have engaged remote working, for those organizations that have engaged remote working, um, the exposure has really shifted from a, a network and information security standpoint. Um, it's vital that the cybersecurity hygiene exercised by those individuals in their usual office environment um, makes the shift or, or the complete transition into the home environment. Um, and for those that have remained open throughout the pandemic, the exposure has again shifted not only operationally from, from the obvious standpoint, but also from a data retention standpoint. Um, many organizations are now collecting personal health information on employees, maybe on customers, on guests, um, that perhaps they weren't collecting in the past. It was never something that was considered necessary or useful. Um, and, and so this could be for contact tracing. It could be for temperature checks to make sure that, um, you know, there's no... Uh, COVID exposure coming into your office environment, um, or, or there could be other forms of sensitive information that, again, wasn't really considered useful uh, even six months ago. Um, so a few takeaways um, as to how this information is, a few takeaways to take into consideration um, are, are how is this information being protected? Um, have we changed our data retention or data uh, destruction policies to, to adhere to the health information that we maybe are maintaining that we, that we wouldn't have maintained before? Um, how long are we maintaining and, and safeguarding this data? And, and how long do we have this information? What's reasonable? What do we, how long do we have to keep it for? And, and, and again, how is it being uh, disposed of when we don't need it any longer? Excellent. Thanks, Brian. Right. Moving on to the next slide. Um, this slide speaks to where the industry is being targeted as, as targeted the most. And how have our experiences been at Gallagher? And, and would you say, that there are any industries that may be immune to suffering an attack? Um, based on our experiences uh, and, and based on the slide that you see, again, this is from Beasley's, uh, Beasley's 2020 breach briefing or breach report. Um, we've seen a, a large portion of claims, claims activity fall into the professional services, public service and manufacturing sectors. Um, and with that said, I think it's it's fairly safe to say, though, that there's there's no one that's immune to suffering an attack, per se. Um, while targeted attacks are real and they certainly do exist, uh, so do untargeted attacks where a threat actor might be attacking an IP address and really have no clue um, until access is granted by way of clicking that link or opening that email attachment as to who or what they may have. Um, so with that being said, and, and at the risk of sounding cliche, and I know it's been said many times before, it's... Um, it's truly not a matter of, of if, but a matter of when an interruption or a breach or a negative impact of sorts related to a network event takes place. And it may not be an event on your own system. It could be a, a network event suffered by, uh, it could be an, uh, an event suffered by your, your own organization, but also an impact um, to your organization or your operations due to a uh, network event suffered by a third party in your supply chain. Um, it could be something as simple as a stolen laptop or a lost laptop that can contain sensitive information. It could be the theft of paper files out of your office. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a network event on your own system to trigger a breach um, or if insured a claim under your insurance policy. Um, yes, the attention is often focused on the ransomware component and it's certainly the, the buzz in the industry that and, and business email compromise, but um, the, the exposure is much greater than just that. Um, the, the exposures in the different uh, sectors that, that are listed on, on the pie chart um, are different, or they, they can be different, and they vary. They vary from one to another. A healthcare risk that maintains a significant amount of personal or sensitive information has a heightened privacy and third-party liability exposure. Um, a manufacturer that likely maintains very little in the way of information um, has a heightened operational exposure if their manu manufacturing process is tied to 
to their network infrastructure and from a ransomware or denial of service standpoint, um, they could certainly suffer a, a fairly significant business, business interruption um, loss if, if their systems were to be impacted. Um, taking a step back and, and making sure we understand operationally what our what our true exposures are and how the coverage may respond, uh, I think is, is is something that's critical. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. So this this um, this shows what well, one one Bitcoin is equivalent to in Canadian dollars as of August nineteenth, twenty twenty. Um, how has, and, and can you touch on how the exposure to ransomware itself evolved and and what the process looks like and, and what are some of the costs involved in the remediation of an actual ransomware event? Yeah, sure. So one of the biggest changes and perhaps the biggest concerns related, in my opinion at least, to, to cybersecurity and the cyber insurance market um, specifically is the evolution and the increase in the size of these ransomware demands that we're seeing. Uh, in most cases, gone are the days of the $2,000, $3,000, $10,000 demand, even in the small, small to medium-sized business space, um, as we've seen demands creep up into the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars and even into the millions on a more complex attack, uh, you know, one containing a large amount of sensitive information um, or a larger organization and the threat actor actually knows what they have and who they have. Um, we're seeing these large demands much more consistently. Uh, if we had this conversation a couple of years ago, the messaging may have been a little bit different. However, uh, based on our own experiences, uh, the demands have shown well into the hundreds of thousand dollars. And, and in many different examples, I think the real shocking part is, is when we talk about who's being affected by these demands, it's not just the, the national or global names that you hear frequently in the news, but the local shops and local firms in your own community. Um, not so long ago, when Bitcoin was worth far less than fifteen thousand dollars. Now, as you can see, based on based on the image on the slide, it does fluctuate rather significantly. Um, but it does hover around that fifteen thousand dollar mark today. And, and nowadays, even a demand of three Bitcoin, based on these trading prices, we're looking at almost fifty thousand dollars right there in just a ransom payment alone. Um, a recent report from from an insure tech coalition suggests that. Uh, after ransomware demands increased by 100% from 2019 to 2020, they increased again by another 47% between the first quarter and second quarter of 2020. So what does that look like for us as an organization or for you as an organization uh, when an employee mistakenly clicks a link? Um, you know, we come in on Monday morning or we get a phone call from IT on a Friday night and our systems are locked down. There's a ransom note um, attached demanding a large sum of money. Whether this is insured or uninsured, the process, it, is largely the same. Um, there are many difficult questions that you're gonna be asked. There's many difficult questions that you're gonna be asking of others in those immediate moments after an attack. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of easy answers. Some of those questions, um, just to you know, ramble off the first 10 or 12 that come to mind, you know, what happened and how did it happen? Uh, has data been exfiltrated outside the organization? Have backups been corrupted or have they been affected at all? Uh, do we need to engage the threat actor to begin negotiating the ransom demand? If we have to pay the ransom demand, um, you know, how are we going to acquire that Bitcoin or the necessary cryptocurrency in order to facilitate that payment? And do we have the resources ready, readily available to us to make a payment in the tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars? Should we be engaging law enforcement? And what are, what are some of the obligations that we have from a regulatory perspective? Finally, how are we going to control the messaging? I think that's a key one in communication uh, on one of our earlier conversations today uh, through a Gallagher Talks. One of the slide messages said that communication is critical, and I think that's the case here as well, um, that you know, we have to be able to control the messaging to employees or third parties that ought to be made aware because that message gets out. It could hurt us quite significantly from a reputational standpoint. Um, so really, I guess back to the original question from the onset, um, engagement of third-party breach counsel is necessary to, to quarterback the breach situation. And again, this is whether we're dealing with an insured loss or an uninsured loss. Um, we need somebody there to quarterback the situation that understands the process, understands the nuances from a regulatory standpoint, um, one that can engage us with the appropriate resources to mitigate the damage and remediate that aftermath. Um, and like I said, ensure that regulatory matters are being being addressed accordingly. This this could be Canadian legislation, it could be U.S. state legislation, it could be uh, the GDPR in the U.K. or other foreign le legislation if we operate uh, on a global scale. So as much as possible, it's very very key to engage breach counsel first, 
um, to try and protect as much information throughout this process as we can under privilege. There's going to be a, there could be a lot of information that comes out about, you know, the network security or the security hygiene of the organization throughout the course of these investigations and the forensic investigation. So as much as possible, if we can engage um, these resources through breach counsel to try and protect that information from coming out in the courts, um, it's going to be, it's going to be key. Um, Forensics would then be immediately engaged uh, and get to work, hopefully answering many of those questions above. Um, the process does, however, take time. So I think it's just a, it's a fair caution um, that it's really no different than a, than a fire loss in, in that we have a loss to property. In this, in this case, we have a loss to data um, and it's going to take time to be able to negotiate and, and negotiate the demand and, and restore the data. And average network downtimes are usually in the multiples of days or even weeks. Um, before you know we have access to some of our data and in some cases it could be a very long period of time before we have everything back up and running um operationally and smoothly great thanks brian um moving on um, as exposures continue to evolve and, and the strategies of these cyber criminals change what are insurers doing to adapt make sure that they are providing a product that meets the needs of their clients uh, insurers are, are certainly doing their best to keep up with the, with the shift in exposures. Wordings continue to evolve with, with that shift. Um, the market is very saturated. Uh, it's still largely competitive and there's, there's a lot of capacity out there. It's not a, it's not the same concern that we have from a property or liability standpoint. If you've tuned into any of our earlier talks today, or if you're going to throughout the day, you're going to hear that a lot. Um, the challenge, however, is, is the comparison from a, from a broker perspective or from a policyholder perspective. That challenge is the comparison from insurance company A to insurance company B or C, and that it's not, it's not really easy all the time. Um, the coverage is starting to become more uniform, um, but there's still nuances between every insurance company and, and what they're offering. Um, in many cases, one may call something one thing and, and another insurer will call it something completely different where they're looking to cover the exact same thing, but, but to the untrained eye, they may not recognize this and, and they may view it as, as a gap in coverage or, or, or something of the like. Um, I believe that the next big shift that we're going to see um, from, a, from a coverage perspective uh, will surround regulatory requirements um, in various jurisdictions around the globe. And I, I think that has to do with, uh, with obviously the changes that we've seen from a regulatory standpoint um, around the globe. Just in the past 24 months, we've seen new legislation passed in Canada from a federal perspective, uh, new legislation from a provincial perspective, with the most recent being in Quebec. Uh, new state legislation across all 50 states in the U.S. with the most recent and imposing legislation being adopted by the state of California and the California Consumer Protection Act, and then, of course, the GDPR in the U.K. So taking a look back at how insurers adapt to this or offer solutions at least to address these concerns will be, uh, will be an interesting shift as, as this legislation comes, comes more, more sort of the forefront. Yeah, it seems like there's definitely a lot of going on continuously um still staying on the insurance topic how comprehensive are cyber insurance policies at this point in time yeah i think you know as well as i do that it seems every week we have a, a change in policy language we have a new insuring agreement perhaps a new exclusion or a new definition um a new endorsement available um with that said though coverage is as broad as it's ever been um, new versions of wordings continue to be released by, by various insurers, largely containing expansions of coverage to address the evolving exposure, whether it's supply chain risk, cyber crime, or social engineering. Um, coverage for bodily injury or property damage as, the result of a, 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 as a result of a network event, uh, pollution cover. Uh, it's really becoming more and more expansive and tailored to, to what that organization may need. Um, as noted previously, however, though, it's really imperative for one to understand the coverage that they have, whether it's purchased on a, on a standalone basis, whether it's purchased as an extension on a property and casualty policy where coverage can be quite limited. Um, you know, there's a lot of different endorsements available in the marketplace. So I think it's very important for, for one to understand um, exactly what coverage you are buying, uh, what it does for you, and, and perhaps more importantly, sometimes what it may not do for you. Yeah, and, and I know we've touched a lot on market conditions today, so other, the other uh, presentations that have, have happened, but are there any concerns on the forefront or, or any changes in the market conditions?
the the Canadian cyber market is certainly still on its maturing stage or the maturation process. Um, as noted previously, claims activity has begun to increase with significance uh, in both severity and frequency, uh, and these losses do continue to climb. Certainly not to the extent of the property and liability and, and even DNO markets. Uh, we are starting to see inclinations, though, of hardening in the cyber market with, with carriers looking for rate um, in, in certain sectors of business more specifically. Uh, this is very largely due to the very large losses that are being suffered on the global spectrum, um, but also the slower infiltration of, of these large losses being suffered within our own borders in Canada. Um, how insurers handle ransomware, given the trends uh, we're seeing, will be of interest, I think, to brokers and policyholders alike. Um, perhaps elevated retentions or copay requirements surrounding ransomware payments. Um, you know, we'll pay the first 50 percent. You have to pay the other 50 percent or, you know, you'll have a ten thousand uh, dollar deductible or attention on on privacy related losses but if we have to pay ransom you know you're paying fifty thousand dollars or whatever the case may be um you could look at sublimits of coverage in some of these areas uh, and so on i don't i don't know that it's an immediate concern for us in canada yet um we will be keeping a close eye on it especially as it evolves uh in other jurisdictions around the world where where we tend to kind of follow form from a from a rate standpoint or from a market standpoint um we'll keep a close eye on the sustainability of these current rates, uh, the profitability of, of insurers in this space as a result of these large ransomware payments and, and the resulting business interruption that they're paying as a result. This is ultimately going to be what drives market appetite and, and these hardening conditions. Moving on to uh, the prevention and mitigation part of this presentation, what are insurance companies generally looking for um, when they're providing insurance to companies? What do they what do they see as most important from a security perspective? That's that's an interesting question, and I think it's it really depends on which insurers you're asking. Um, in many instances, clients are expecting to complete a long form application in order to procure quotes or obtain quotations on the coverage. However, we have insurance companies now offering platforms in the small to medium sized business space. Those traditionally we'll call it revenues of, of less than fifty million dollars. Um, to obtain quotations without the need for even an application form or with very few questions surrounding security being asked. It's not to say that those insurers don't feel that this information is important. Um, however, they've developed tools that allow them to obtain this information in other ways, uh, whether it's through the public facing internet, um, and combining that with their findings uh, with, within their quantum of data that they have themselves um, to generate quotations based on on the information that, that they're able to pull um, without asking you to complete a, a complex or technical application. Um, this certainly doesn't apply in all cases um, and, and don't wanna get that confused or, or, or misconveyed at all. Um, certainly from a more complex risk standpoint, applications or risk control calls are required to fulfill that underwriting process. You know, what are we doing from a security standpoint? Um, how have we been affected right now with, with work from home and, and COVID? And, and the changes that we've made there, um, you know, and, and even more so now, I would say that that the security uh, the security component is is something that is of interest to, to obviously many insurers. Um, they're looking for different prevention items that, that are noted on the screen. Um, Multi-factor authentication is the biggest one that we hear probably most frequently across really any any size of business. Um, again, more so with a with huge increase in remote work and those accessing company networks or infrastructure remotely. Um, they're looking to make sure that that, that connection is secure. Um, encryption of, of sensitive data while both in transit and, and while it's at rest. Uh, system patching protocols is a big one uh, to ensure that known security vulnerabilities within the software that you're using uh, are being patched. Um, making sure that we're not using any software that maybe doesn't have uh, supported patches anymore um, because it's out of date or out of life. Um, threat actors actually use that information um, to attack known vulnerabilities that that you're not patching if you're not in, if you're not installing these patches. And so the same thing can apply in your personal life with Apple, for example, releasing an iOS patch for your iPhone and you don't uh, download it or you don't install it because you're concerned you're going to lose all your pictures. Um, you know, you're leaving a security vulnerability within your own within your own within your own network or within your own devices. Um, ultimately could affect you personally, it could affect your corporation or your organization um, and so on. So it's very important to make sure that patches are being upgraded. Um, and then limiting access to data uh, to employees on a need to know basis. Uh, last but certainly not least is the security awareness training. Um, 
again with with the shift to remote work ensuring that employees are being trained to know what to click and what not to click and and it really comes down to developing a strong culture for cybersecurity across the entire network i think it's it's imperative it's critical to do that um, not using a fail, failed phishing test against an employee um, as a source of harassment or humiliation or making them feel bad or making them feel scared, using it as a learning mechanism so they, so they feel comfortable coming to IT to ask the question. Call before you dig, ask before you click, and feel comfortable in, in, in doing that. That's a, that's a great point, Brian. So when it comes to, it seems like they're, they're really never ever guarantees a cyber incident will never impact the company. Can you talk about some of the things that are important from a mitigation standpoint? For sure, yeah. So you've hit the nail on the head that there really is no silver bullet, unfortunately. Uh, if I talk to IT professionals, most commonly the biggest fear or concern that keeps them up at night is that human element. Um, somebody within their environment clicking on a link that may have serious ramifications on the business. Um, they can only do so much. The, the good guys, the IT team has to be perfect 100% of the time. The bad guys need to be right one time. They could try a thousand times and only need to be right once to be able to impact an organization quite significantly. So if and when a network event does happen, um, there are several items that can impact the ability to survive and mitigate that incident. Backing up the data is one, of course. I mean, it's pretty, pretty standard for organizations to back up data. Um, but how many times are you backing up that data? Um, where's that data being stored? Um, those backups being stored. And, and it's very important to be testing the integrity of those backups to ensure that if we do need to use them, that they're ready to go. Um, where are those backups being stored? Like I said, are they on-site? Are they off-site? Are they in the cloud? How frequently is data being backed up? Is it instantaneous? Is it you know twice a day? Is it once a week? What it, how, how frequently is, 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 is that data being backed up? And, and are those backups being encrypted? Um, threat actors have shown an increasing ability to target backups, and obviously if they target backups and we aren't able to use backups to restore our data, that's really when, then when, we, when we start to look at paying ransoms and having to pay that ransom demand. Um, when a ransomware event may hit tomorrow morning, uh, it's very likely that the threat actor has been in your IT environment for an extended period of time, often upwards of multiple months scoping where they where they are, what they might have. Um, and at the same time, they may be encrypting data on the back end or corrupting backups to render them useless. So when they propagate the attack, you're, you go to use your backups and they're not available to you. So it's very important that we're testing the integrity of those backups. Um, and then last, um, kind of covers off a few points on the slide, is, is the creation of uh, business continuity plans or the instant response plan. Um, and, and then the testing of those plans through tabletop exercises, uh, to ensure that all key stakeholders from the C-suite to IT to management uh, are all aware and on the same page um, as part of the organization's plan to continue operations through what could be an extended network interruption. Figuring out who those key stakeholders are inside the organization uh, is important, but also looking at who those key stakeholders are outside the organization um, is, is equally important. Breach counsel, uh, who, who are we going to call the quarterback and, and handle our regulatory affairs and, and make sure, again, that we're, we're containing as much information as we can under privilege. IT forensics, who's going to be the ones responsible for storing data? Public relations, who's going to be the ones to control that messaging? Um, if we buy insurance, what does our insurance policy look like or require from us in the event of a breach? How do we notify our insurer? What does that process look like? What's the involvement of our broker? Um, the arrangement of an onboarding call with your insurer, the broker, and the response team um, can go a really long way, I think, in, in ensuring that the process itself is much more streamlined than it would be if we are trying to figure it out as we go. Perfect. That's excellent, Brian. I know we're a little bit on time here, so I'm going to wrap this up. Brian, thank you very much for all your insight into the world of cyber today, and thank, every, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Like Tyler said earlier, we will respond to any questions that have come through the chat room within the next couple of days. Thanks again.